at the Centre for Hellenic Studies at Harvard University. And she holds a PhD in political philosophy and an MA in political theory. In 2020, she was the youngest female scholar to receive the Academy of Athens Award for Philosophy. And in 2019, she founded Athenoa, a school of philosophy based in Athens, devoted to the study of ancient Hellenic philosophy. Um, I hope, Athena, you could tell us a little bit more about that at the end, because um, we'd, we'd love to hear about that. Um, on the 5th of February at 2 p.m., so the same time next week, she'll begin a three-session course entitled Apollo, the Light of Consciousness. Um, you're all very welcome. So over to you, Athena. We'd love to hear from you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much, Elizabeth and Julie, for your very kind invitation. I'm very happy to be with you here at the Fintry Trust and uh, with this uh, wonderful group of people. Thank you all very much for, for showing up and being here in this talk today. So it's uh, with the great joy today that um, I will be sharing with you part of my journey in this beautiful field, this beautiful stream of life called philosophy. Philosophy is a way of life after all, further to our area of inquiry. And in, in, in that sharing, in that sharing that, um, to be honest, it will be, first of all, a sharing from the heart, a sharing from, from life and a sharing from aspiration and experience. I will also get the chance to present to you some of the ideas that ancient Hellenic philosophers had about the very nature, purpose and methods of philosophy. And in that regard, my presentation today is oriented in talking about how philosophy, philosophia, that ancient path that was born in the gulfs of sixth century BC Greece is indeed a spiritual path, a spiritual path that has as its goal, the very fulfillment of our human nature. The, the attainment of that global, universal human inspiration, which is to be whole, to be free, and to be happy. And so in that respect, I'm going to be talking about Hellenic philosophy as not exactly what is being mostly taught in modern institutions nowadays in philosophy schools, not as an armchair vocation and uh, an intellectual endeavor of arguments, counter arguments and logical, logical presuppositions. But I'm gonna speak about Hellenic philosophy as this holistic experiential path of life that can lead us all to that which we most long for, which is happiness, spiritual liberation. And I'm gonna speak about that through um, my own experience, my, of course, my own understanding, but also in bringing in some aspects of ancient scholarship and quotes and bibliography from the answer, ancient scriptures, which although are there, they're not primarily studied, not in all, but in very many departments of philosophy nowadays. And it is my, my hope and aspiration that in this day and age, we will be able to recover some of that quintessential core lived aspect of philosophy in our education, because I truly believe that this type of education can lead to a healthier and better society, a society of truly free people and justice. So before I open up my PowerPoint to share that journey um, into the nature, the definition, the goal of philosophy and the accounts that we find in ancient philosophical texts about how the philosophers themselves had experienced that fulfillment and blossoming of human life. I'd like to begin with um, a short personal testimony sharing account of how I got so excited, as you can see, and so in love with this path, because I call myself a lover. I'm a lover. 
first of all, I'm a lover of wisdom. I'm a lover of philosophy. That's how I understand myself. I'm, I'm not I'm not a knower. I'm a lover. I'm a lover of truth. And I have been a lover of truth since I can remember myself. But there's a specific moment in my life that I will never forget. And it's um, around that age that puberty begins, adolescence begins, and we, we start to develop our intellectual faculties and, and, and begin to search, who am I? Why am I here? What is, what is existence? What is the purpose of this life, right? We all start to have at least some existential um, arising of, of, of questions around that time. Of course, perhaps earlier too, but definitely that's the time that we begin to think about those matters a bit deeply deeper. So um, I remember I was at school and it was uh, during a literature and Greek language class that our um, school teacher mentioned Plato. And the moment I heard that name, I was lit up from within. It was like my eyes opened like that wide open. I'm like, wow, Plato, that sounds so familiar. I know that. I want to learn more about this. So I go up to my teacher at the end of the class and I'm like I want to know more Can you, why why don't you teach us philosophy right at the age of 14 we are in Greek uh, curricula we we are taught philosophy but a bit later around 16 17 years old so I'm like I want to know more about that now and 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 the teacher bless him he did the next time uh during class bring me uh some platonic dialogues and some commentaries where I could have the opportunity to read um parts of of various platonic dialogues. And I remember I'm home, I light up the fireplace, it was winter, and I sit there in front of the fire in an afternoon, and I begin to read, read Plato and read his accounts about the world of ideas and the contact with the world of ideas and all this poetic and an emotional surge that arises in the human soul once it connects to those other and, and richer and deeper spiritual dimensions of being. And in that day and time, I think I had one of my first most intimate spiritual experiences because I have the memory of disappearing. I disappeared. I was in a state of no space and no time, absence, wholeness, fulfillment, which in the eyes of the 14 year old girl that I was, that didn't have any experience in meditation or anything like that. It was truly a marvelous, marvelous testimony, marvelous event. And I remember coming back to my senses and having this feeling, wow, what just happened? And after that moment, I said to myself, wow, I remember that's why I'm here. That's why I've, I've been born. This is what I'm supposed to do. Plato is the love of my life, right? So the journey begins then. And um, after that, of course, I pursued um, uh, an academic life. Um, I love scholarship. I love academia. And I was actually led to the UK where I studied for all my degrees. And I actually lived there for 10 years. And um, I had the privilege of, of a very... Uh, broad and and rich uh, education. However, in none of my degrees, apart from the exception perhaps of some lectures or some lectures and teachers, was I ever brought in contact with a path that could teach me how to experience liberation the way Plato described it in his dialogues and the way I had just begun to taste those little droplets when I was a teenager. Yes, there was a lot of rigorous study. Yes, there was beautiful cultivation of the mind, but nowhere did I find the deeper cultivation and knowledge of myself and soul that I knew Hellenic philosophy was all about. Of course, we all know and we remember, right? We go at the temple of Apollo in Delphi and the first thing we see written in front of the entrance of the temple of Apollo is the precept, the very known Delphic precept, know thyself which is actually one of the 147 precepts, pith instructions that we have that we call Delphic precepts. And whereas most of the other, perhaps the 145 precepts below, belong to the very well-known famous 
um, seven sages or wise men of antiquity, that particular uh, particular precept is said to have been given by Apollo himself. And so although I was taught to learn things and ideas, I was not taught how to know myself. And that um, inspired in me um, a kind of a parallel mode of inquiry into myself through the comparative study of all ancient um, spiritual paths until doing a full circle. I'm not going to go more into that because now I want to open up the presentation until after um, learning and, and being um, initiated into various other spiritual traditions, I was able to return back to the ancient texts and realize that the methods are there, the accounts are there. And what is left with us is the choice of whether we want to pursue that path in that lived, intimate, personal way. And ever since that began in 2011, that's what I have devoted uh, my life into. And that is um, uh, the purpose of, of, of the school that has begun here in Greece. And perhaps I'm going to tell you more about that at the end of the talk, as Elizabeth has kindly suggested. So after that small journey into my own journey, <laughs> I will now like to open the, the presentation, the PowerPoint presentation, and have a little journey into and through the uh, accounts, the major, some major accounts of philosophy and philosophies, uh, flourishings and fruits into our lives um, by the writings that we get from ancient scholarship. So let me see how I can open up. Okay, the PowerPoint here. Um, can everyone uh, see it? Can I just get a nod from someone? Can you see it? Yeah, okay, thank you. So today I've already started to talk with you about Hellenic philosophy as a path to awakening and happiness, something which um, is also pithily summarized in that very famous quote at the entrance of the Apollo temple, know thyself, know yourself, as the very essence of, essence of philosophy as self-inquiry. So, as I said before, know thyself was inscribed at the very entrance of the temple of Apollo as one of the main Delphic precepts, along with uh, the cryptic E or Epsilon, uh, and the very well-known, equally well-known precept, miden aran, which means everything in moderation or nothing in excess or exceed nothing. And it's quite interesting that both know thyself and the cryptic epsilon about which Plutarch has actually written a whole treat called the Epsilon. Adelphi are assigned to Apollo himself. And although Plutarch gives us uh, a beautiful and rich account of the various interpretations of what that Epsilon could have met, meant at the center of the Apollo entrance, one of the most common or perhaps straightforward interpretations of, of that word, which was written as epsilon or epsilon iota, epsilon and i, um, is the uh, second person um, verb of I am in me, which means you are. So epsilon or epsilon iota means you are. So here we are at the entrance of the Apollo's temple in Delphi, and, and we get two messages, the one being know yourself, that is the essence of approaching God. Because remember, people that would have reached the entrance of, of the Temple of Apollo were there to know God, to have an experience of divinity, of the transcendental. And right at that entrance, instead of Apollo saying, welcome, right, here I am, he gave that message to, uh, uh, to, to the people attempting to approach him, saying, if you want to know me, know yourself. Know yourself, that is the key that can 
bring you into contact with that which you seek inside the temple. And right next to that precept, know thyself, here it is, E, which means you are. So in a sense, you are what you're seeking. You are the divinity that you seek inside the temple in things external of yourself. So here we all have two powerful messages that both point to the inquiry and the science and the knowledge of ourselves. We are and know ourselves, know what we are. We are already that which we seek in external things as the fulfillment and flourishing of our nature. In, in knowing what we already are, we can find that secret to happiness. So my presentation will follow the following structure. What is philosophy? What is the purpose of, what is the purpose or the end of philosophy? What are some of the aspects? Of course, I cannot cover everything today. We're talking about um, a tradition of more than 2,000 years. If we begin with the uh, free Orphic and, and uh, Orphic paths, but I'm going to present some of those methods that we have from philosophers such as Pythagoras, uh, Plato, and the Neoplatonics. And in the end, I'd like to discuss with you, and perhaps we can open up the discussion, the collective discussion to that, into what is the relevance of all that for us today. So I would like to begin by remembering, reminding us that Philosophia, philosophy, is a term that we first encounter in the work of the great scholar and mystic, mystic and scholar Pythagoras. So although the idea of self-inquiry exists in Greece, obviously way before Pythagoras, in Orpheus, of course, and in the tradition of the mystics, of the theologians and of the theurgists, and that's why it's inscribed at the entrance, of the temple of Apollo, so the idea of self-inquiry, the idea of the science of self is there. Nevertheless, we are informed that the term in itself, philosophy, is given first by the scholar Pythagoras, who was born in Samos Island around 580 BCE. And so his father was Mnisarchos, his mother was Parthenis, which means uh, the virgin one, the pure one, the virtuous one. And he, she later took the name Pythais because of that specific event. And the event is that while Parthenis, later on Pythais, was pregnant into uh, Pythagoras, uh, it was um, very early on in her pregnancy, she visited with her husband, Misarchos, the temple of Delphi in order to get a prophecy regarding some of the merchant trips of Misarchos in the East. And whereas the couple went to the oracles to seek advice and prophecies about a very different matter, the temple priests gave them a very different prophecy than they expected. And that prophecy had to do with their son that was still in, in Parthenis um, belly at the time. And the oracle said, your son will be very different by all men in wisdom and beauty and will benefit the entire humanity. And so from that announcement that the young couple from Samos got about Pythagoras, Pythagoras received his name, Pith Agoras. Agorevo, Agora, right, is a space that we need to speak about, to speak about things. And the ruler of Logos, as much as the ruler of, of uh, trade, is Hermes, the god that also rules over Agora, the place that people in ancient times went to exchange not only goods and services, but also ideas. So because she was announced by Pythia or Peth Apollo, one of the, of the names uh, or the characterizations of Apollo, his name was Pythagoras. And of course, uh, we have a lot of descriptions about his life, and especially from Iamblichus, who states that Pythagoras was not, did not simply have his name because he was announced by Pythia, but because he was an emanation of Apollo coming here into the agora of the many, of the becoming of forms and, and humans and, and, and life to to give us enlightened teaching. So there is this idea that Pythagoras has this divine descent, something that of course 
his contemporaries also believed as well. And so if we see here a small um, time frame about uh, the life of Pythagoras, we'll see that Pythagoras comes right here around 6 BC to the transition to the, in the to the transition of the golden age of the fifth century BC, and in a way combines the two movements that the one precedes him and, and the one uh, comes after him. The one is a pre-Socratic movement here with Thales, Anaximeters, Anaximenes, Heraclitus, Anaxagoras, where we, we locate the birth of modern science because those philosophers turned um, around uh, and further to the uh, Orphic that precedes them tradition that sought to understand the nature of divinity, uh, those philosophers turned their gaze into nature and they said, we need to understand the origin and the nature of the world. Of course, the way they perceived that, just to make that note, it wasn't materialistic, right? Their idea of matter was quite different to the one that modern science have today. They consider matter to be, to be animate, they consider matter to be something um, intimately um, interwoven with divinity, but I'm not going to go into that because it's a different topic, but just want to say that we have the birth of modern science, but in not exactly in the materialistic sense that we understand that science nowadays. And of course, after Pythagoras, right, we have all the tradition leading up to Socrates and then um, Socratic Platonic philosophy. And Pythagoras is right, right there, right in the in-between uh, historical step. And what is equally of note is the greater historical context of the earth during which Pythagoras is born. And it is very, very interesting, and in my view, thought-provoking, to observe that Pythagoras was born around the same time that to other major reformers in themselves and creators or, or, or institutors of new spiritual traditions are born. One, of course, in China, Lao Tse in 571 BC, and the other, the Buddha, Siddhartha Gautama, 564 BC in India. So it's very interesting to see that in different places, in uh, Far East, in the East, and in, in, in ancient Greece, we have the, at the same time, arising or birth of those great spill ritual teachers that are bringing a spiritual reformation to the planet. There is a time for cultural change, and there is a leap of collective consciousness that they mediate because they all bring paths of awakening or enlightenment. Taoism, the Tao in the case of Lao Tse, Buddhism, this great spiritual tradition of enlightenment in the case of Buddha, and philosophy in the case of Pythagoras. So let me just see the time because I get so happy about talking about those things that <laughs> I go into the eternity and I'd like to keep some track of time. So um, I'm just going to mention a few a few things about, uh, about Pythagoras' uh, life. The fact that he was, for example, taught by a very, very, a very early age from Thales and Anaximander something that informs us of the fact that he was he was very much aware and actually initiated into um, pre-Socratic scientific philosophy or physical philosophy. But we also have this interesting event about his life um, that is recorded in his biographies, that when he was really young, while his father was coming back to his house from, from the Agora, he found in the street, or actually not in the street, in the uh, in the woods, uh, a, a, a child that is called the star child or Astreos. They didn't know where this child came from. They didn't know uh, who's the, his parents, whom his parents were. But that child apparently was eating the droplets of 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 the sun and of the water from the air. So he was actually doing something like a pranic pranic um, diet. He was, he was eating prana from his environment and he was taken on to the house to grow up with Pythagoras. So I'm just mentioning those this story um, as some of the myths or true stories um, surrounding the divine origin that the ancients thought that Pythagoras had, that he was an emanation. He wasn't just a simple human being. That's That was his the belief at the time 
and for many centuries later on. So he was a very special child. He was recognized by the sages. Thales was one of the seven sages of his time. And they gave him the very strong reference letters so he could be accepted by Pharaoh Amasis to study with the high priests of Egypt. The esoteric schools of Egypt was something like the Harvard or the Oxford or the Cambridge of spirituality and science at the time. It was very hard. The priests themselves didn't want to accept someone who was a foreigner, but they did accept him and they tested him. And they saw that this was a very special incarnation. This was a very special being. And so he studied for 22 years as an esoteric student in the Egyptian mysteries. And then he went on to Persia for another 12 years where he was initiated into Eastern mystic arts, the art of theurgy. And there are some accounts that purport that he actually went to India as well, where he sat and, and, and learned with the Brahmins. And so Pythagoras leaves Greece around the age of 17 and returns to Greece at the age of 56, where he continues to study. He goes and he travels all around Greece and he studies with the Orphic mystics. He meets um, Epimenides in Crete. Epimenides was a very well-known um, uh, which means purifier. He was doing energetic purification and mass catharsis on an energetic level and karma level. And in that way, supposedly was lifting the karma of, of ancient cities that have sinned. I'm mentioning all those things. Why? Because we have those ideas of energetic cleansing, prana, emanation, all those, all those keywords that I'm throwing around can be also found in the other traditions that I mentioned, for example, Buddhism, Hinduism, and so forth. And they're very much um, also reappearing in Western societies now with movements of, of, of new age movements and, and spiritual movements that are becoming uh, very popular in our lives, right? But here we find the same ideas in the ancient Hellenic scriptures. Of course, he was initiated into the Leipzinian mysteries, and he was also a reformer of them. And then he went on to Delphi, where he stayed for a year, serving as a high priest and also reformed the ritual practices there. He was able to stay in silence for very, very, very long times. He His aura was glowing, say his uh, biographers. He, of course, he was an ardent meditator, and he was able to recount many of his incarnations one by one. And so after all that, Samos didn't appear to be the most fertile ground to build his school. So here he is finding Italy, finding the uh, southern part of Italy in Croton, and he introduces his school of philosophy called Omakoion. It's a very, very nice term, very mystical and intricate term. It basically means those that together hear, that are hearing together. Uh, that's a riddle to be deciphered another time. So, philosophia. Philosophia as the term testifies, is a path of law and wisdom. Or later on, Socrates' teacher, Diotima, will tell us that it's a path of eros. Eros, not in the way we use the term today. Eros as being in love, being passionately, madly, ontologically in love with truth, with wisdom. And some etymology here, philo, of course, philia means uh, friendship, but it also means love. We say philanthropy, right? Philosophy. And Sophia means wisdom. Now, a deeper examination into the word, something that we Greeks very much love to do in the ancient times, um, is to interpret philo coming from the etymology of f and ileo. f is the word, is the letter that describes fire and false light. That's where we get the word of fire and phenomenon. And ileo is a verb that literally means, perhaps helix has some etymological um, uh, connection here, to embrace something, to envelop something. So I love something when I embrace myself around it, I give myself around it with warmth and light. And, 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 and emotions of friendships and emotions of compassion. And Sophia means inner light, says one etymological approach. Uh, although they say that the word uh, is uh, 
vague etymologically, but one of the interpretations is that esophos, inner light. So esophia, esophia, sophia. So philosophy is first and foremost a path that begins out of love. It's a love affair. As Socrates' teacher was, was teaching Diotima, philosophy is a path of eros where the, the lover, the seeker, develops a love affair, a divine love affair with, not with a person, not with a body, but with truth and with God or the good in itself. And I'm emphasizing this aspect. Why? Because although in ancient times, the art of love was considered to be intrinsically interwoven into the art and practice of philosophy, nowadays we don't very much learn about love when we go to study philosophy, right? Whereas according to the very term, one cannot begin the path without having that spark of love towards, towards truth and towards the nature of being arising one's heart. And actually that path, as we learn further on from, especially from Socrates and Plato, is a path that has steps and the education of love is an education that was considered of the utmost importance and it was actually handed out very carefully by teachers to students as part of the philosophical curriculum, right? So love, let's keep that. Love is the beginning of, of, of wisdom, the beginning of philosophy. What is the purpose of philosophy? To understand what is the nature of philosophy, of course, we have to understand what is the purpose of philosophy or what is the goal? And now we're gonna step into that second part of, of my presentation where we're going to uh, account, we're going to read some of the ancient testimonies of how the ancient philosophers themselves approach, defined and experienced, keyword, experienced those fruits of philosophy in their lives. So it's important to state that the goal of philosophy can't be named in different ways or can't be approached in different names. Although, let me just make sure to clarify that all those different goals that I'm going to state are different names for the same thing. So the end of philosophy can be called eudaimonia or gnosis, or as we're going to see in a moment, union, union with everything, presence, or knowledge of ourselves, right? So I'm mentioning these four aspects here. Eudaimonia, I'll explain what that means. Gnosis, highest form of knowledge, union, and divine presence or knowledge of one's true self. So those can be considered to be, in a way, synonymous. But each word, term, shines a light upon those different qualities of, of, of the nature and purpose of philosophy. So let's begin by eudaimonia. Why? Because as I started off in my talk to you today, it is what, after all, we all human beings inherently seek. And isn't that what Aristotle said? That the call of human beings or the entelechy, their ontological program is deep, lasting, unwavering wholeness and happiness. Entelechy, what a beautiful word, comes from the three words "n," which means inside, telos, which means end or purpose or perfection, and echo, echin, which means I have. So it's the purpose that we all have inside us as inscribed, as an inscribed goal of our existence. And an example that Aristotle brings sometimes is the seed, let's say, of an oak, of an oak tree, the seed of an oak tree, and the oak tree. And, and he says that as in the little seed of an oak tree, we have inside the very goal of its existence, which is the flourishing of its existence, which is what is actively strives for. Us human beings as well have that same, not the same ontological pro program, but equally an ontological program, which is the goal of our existence inside of us. And that is that we all seek deep, lasting, unwavering happiness. We are by nature lovers and seekers of happiness, of eudaimonia. But that eudaimonia, that sense of being whole, being happy and unwavering, so 
cannot come from any external good or circumstance in reality. Most of us, before we come in, in, in contact with ideas of spirit, spirituality, and so forth, we do seek it in external goods, relationship, circumstances, event, achievements. And although all those can facilitate the flourishing of eudaimonia, eudaimonia is a state that can arise only from knowing ourselves and coming into touch with our true nature or realizing the nature of our being. Of course, the very word inside of it contains this information because eudaimonia comes from the words eth. Sometimes the philosophers call that n, which means the one. F is a word for describing divine pure nature, agathon, the good, ultimate benevolence, God, God without a face, God as the essence, the essence of life, the essence of being, the perfect state, eternal essence, divinity, source. We find the same ideas in, for example, the notion of Tao or the notion of, of Dharmakaya in Buddhist uh, scriptures or Atman in Hindu scripts. But what is interesting, and to be honest, I'm not quite sure if the other civilizations also emphasize this, but it's very interesting about the Hellenic path is that the ancients emphasized that that is also beauty. They love to approach God or F or divine pure nature and call it that it's the ultimate beauty, but it's a beauty beyond forms. It's unmediated beauty. It's beauty in itself is the light of beauty, right? And so they have the word also kalos, kalos karathos. Kalos means also good, virtuous, but also beautiful. And then demon, which is the second aspect or, or, or um, composite part of the word eudaimonia means we know that word, right? We use it in our, in our common vocabularies, demon. Demon, but not in the Christian sense. Demon in the sense of, of that inner true self that is not my body, that is not my personality, that is not my ego, but it's really that droplet of God that I am. Deo means, it's the verb from which demon comes, means I burn with fire. So um, it's, it's, it's what Heraclitus tells us, everything is fire, right? The uni How does he say? Cosmos was not created by God or man, but it, it's an internal fire, aizon pir. So it's that, that is a fiery spirited nature. And also daimon means uh, the knower, the sage, the inner teacher, the inner guru, as they say in other traditions, or our true selves, which is the wisdom consciousness. And Therefore, when do we experience and taste the nectar of eudaimonia in our lives? When we come in contact with that inner teacher, that inner spark of wisdom, consciousness, of very nature of God inside of us. That's when we find fulfillment. Pythagoras also defined the goal of philosophy as union with the one, the, the monad. And here, of course, union also refers us back to the idea of philosophy being a love affair, erotiki, pedagogic, pedagogiki, divine, divine love affair. Because what is the end of love? What do we seek when we're in love? We seek to merge. You see, we seek to unite into one, right? We see, we seek for two to collapse and one to, to manifest, to arise. And so as the end of love. So in the case of, of the philosophical love affair, the end is the union with the one. And isn't it so interesting that in Sanskrit, yoga also means union? Of course, in that union, we get not to achieve something new or to learn something new, but to remember what we are. And hence, Plato in Mina says, all knowledge is remembrance. And in that process, we need to let go of all the things that we are not in order to come in contact with that true nature of, of ourself, because that's the true nature of who we are. It's our entelechy. And the realization of one's true nature is a process that requires us, as Proclus called it, to be gimnitis. Gymnitis means naked soul to undress from all the roles and all the suits that we have worn and 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 to come in talk to, in, come in contact with that fiery essence inside of us. 
And then gnosis, which is an other end, another way to frame or, or articulate the end of philosophy, is non-dual awareness. It's that state of rising beyond phenomena, rising beyond duality, and realizing that which is already here, whole, pure, divine. It's the very essence of, of both intelligence and existence and soul and body. I'm going to come back to that to clarify it a bit more. Hence, Pythagoras says, in his golden verses that in the end, in the end um, of all this philosophical training, and that's how he ends the Pythagorean golden verses, having, if we leave the body, we will rise into the unbound free ether and we will be mortal, incorruptible God, no longer mortals. What's interesting about this quote is that he doesn't write when we're going to leave the body, he writes in, which means if we leave the body. <laughs> so whenever we decide to disentangle from our materiality, that's where we're to be free from, from the, 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 the belief in the attachment to the body. That's where we're going to be able to rise into the ethers. So now I want to move on to a witnessing an account of the end goal of philosophy as awakening or enlightenment that we find in the most inspired treatises of Plotinus. And I'm going to have to, to hold myself back a bit from reading too much from this. I have a few slides on this just because I cannot get enough of the beauty and the elegance and the literacy and, and the inspiration and the immediate transmission through which Latinus speak to us about that testimony, but let's see his words here. Oh, sorry, that, I have to go a bit further. Excuse me. Plotinus is here. Here I have another account, which is from, um, from Plato, but Plato will have to excuse me now that I introduced Plotinus. I'm going to just have to move <laughs> a bit further on and perhaps we, we may come back to that just in a second. So Plotinus gives that idea of enlightenment or awakening or union, calling it the view. Let us remember that the view, it's something that uh, also Socrates speaks about, and it's the uh, very meaning of theoria, what we nowadays call theory. And theoria comes from the words theo, God, or ro, I view, I view the God. And so the end of philosophy is a kind of a view a realization of inconceivable and describable beauty, says Plato in the Republic, or ineffable luminosity, pure light, says Plato in Phaedrus. But no matter how much we try to describe it, let me make also that, is, that um, kind of uh, disclaimer here, we cannot really say it. And here we have the notion of Tao that also states that the Tao that can be told it's not the real Tao. The same idea we find in ancient Greeks. That view is ineffable. It's ariton. It cannot be said. It's a, it's a realization of the mystery of light that unfolds right here, right now, every moment, right before our eyes. And there is no way to articulate it because to articulate it would mean to put put it into words and words function in the world of duality, but that union with the one and the one itself transcends duality, therefore it cannot be told. And so Plotinus brings his own and, 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 and confesses his own, obviously, experience of that by saying, in the Enneads, Enneads 6, chapter 9, there were not two. The seer was one with the scene. It was not even a vision but a union. The one who has become this unification with the Supreme, observe here, the one then becomes unified with the Supreme or realizes he's unified with the Supreme, must, if only she remembers, carry the image impressed upon her. She has become the one. There is nothing within or without her that causes differentiation, separation anymore. Now, no movement, no passion, no out looking or outward desire from the movement, from the moment this ascent is achieved. And let's observe this crucial detail here. No reasoning, no mind, and even to dare the word 
not even the self know more. Speaking about the personality or egoic self here. But he adds, as if caught away, filled with God, she is in perfect stillness, attained in isolation, and arrives at a calm, unwavering state never deviating from her very essence, neither turning to this side nor the other, not even inwards to herself. Utterly resting in being, she has become the very rest. And he adds that, perhaps it's not even of you, unless in a manner unknown. It was an ecstasy, a simplification, unification, an expansion, a complete letting go, a reach towards contact, and at the same time, a complete resting, a meditation towards adjustments. This is the only scene of what rests within the holies. To look otherwise is to fail. <clears throat> and he adds, until this scene comes, they, we, <laughs> are still craving something. But that, which we're craving, only the view, the union, the vision can give. This purpose, this highest goal, can only be attained by those who have transcended all. It is before and beyond all else. When the soul begins the path to ascension, it comes not to something alien, but to its very self. Thus detached, it is not in nothingness, but in itself. Self-gathered, it is no longer in the order of being. It is in the supreme. So here we observe that Plotinus speaks about that ineffable union, non-dual realization, as a return to one's own self, as knowing ourselves. And now, here's an interesting point to add. Especially in nowadays days and times, that we think that the goal of philosophy is to know, is to acquire a set of understandings or propositional knowledge or intellectual knowledge or information or baggages of information. Hmm, the very institutors of philosophy had a completely different idea about that. And actually they thought that knowing or stopping the journey, let me just put it in, 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 in a more uh, correct or, or precise way. Stopping on the way of the path that's called intellectual knowledge is a hindrance and not a fruition of philosophy. Stopping in that path in that step of the path that's called intellectual knowledge, but because it is a it is part of the path. Let me just point that out very clearly. It is part of the path, but stopping there is the hindrance of the fruition of philosophy. And he, he adds here something which is so great, at least for us that have studied philosophy very intellectually. He says, the greatest source of difficulty in all this is that that insight, that awareness of the one of the archi does not come by knowledge. <laughs> it does not come by science or episteme, nor by thinking, reasoning, noises, as in the case of all the other intelligible ideas or beings. Yes, we can know the nature of physics or the laws of physics. Yes, we can know um, logic. Yes, we can know etymology. Yes, we can understand some ideas. But the goal of philosophy cannot be attained in the way we attain this intelligible or intellectual knowledge. We have to let that go. It does not come by knowledge, but by a presence greater than knowledge. So, so we, need to rise up, we need to rise above knowledge itself. We need to let go of knowing. And is that what Socrates was doing when he said, I know one thing that I do not know anything. All right, let go, let go. And he adds something which is also very, very, um, perhaps a bit caustic, but interesting for us in knowing the soul suffers the abandonment of the unity of being. So in a way, he says that when you turn towards knowing in a noetic way, 
you let go of the unity of being and that makes us all suffer again. And there cannot be the simplicity of being when science, epistemic reasoning attempts to conceive it. For science, reasoning is logos, is consciousness, and logos is multiple. The mind thus plunges into number and multiplicity and departs from unity. So our path then leads us beyond knowledge. There may be no wandering from unity. And in a way, we need to understand that every object of thought, even the highest, comes after good. And here he brings that parable that Socrates has also uh, uh, brought us in the Republic that he um, brings a sun symbol and he speaks about the intellectual knowledge or truth being light, the sunlight, and the good or the one towards which we need to ascend being the sun. So the source of, what is the source of reasoning? What is the source of mind? The one, sun. So the end of knowledge is the end of knowledge. <laughs> so the end of knowledge is the moving beyond knowledge into the source of knowledge. And isn't it so interesting that in the Tao we find this verse, verse 71, not knowing is true knowledge. Presuming to know is a disease. First, realize that you're sick, then you can move toward health. The master is her own physician. She has healed herself of all knowing. Thus, she is truly whole. The same truth reverberating here. So, okay, I think that because I'm going to have to wrap up in just a few minutes, I will have to uh, leave my uh, beloved Plotinus back now and move on into say, into, into exploring uh, for the next five minutes or so, the question, what are the ways and methods to reach that union realization of one's true self? Basically, we're asking, what are the steps of the path of awakening or enlightenment that the ancient Hellenic sages, starting with Pythagoras, named philosophy? And that education that they called philosophical education combined Five, five steps, I'm going to come into them, that sought to approach the knowledge of ourself through this tripartite structure that we see also being the nomos or, or, or the prevalent structure around which the ancients built their temples. So ancient temples have three parts, the narthex or the entry, the alcove, the main part where the statue of God is, and then the inner sanctum, the avaton, that's only for priests. And in a way we can apply this approach into what it means to know myself um, by speaking about three approaches, three ways of approaching the self or the three aspects of, our, of the self that we get to know in knowing ourselves. First is the outer knowing of ourselves as a body minds, as personalities, as those beings that were born then and they studied there and they come from this background and they have this marriage and they have these children and they have these degrees, right? The story of our small selves. Then we have the inner approach of ourselves as souls, where we need to learn what's going on in our faculties, our powers of the soul, the mind, the heart, the, the, the will, the appetite, even begin the inner engineering uh, of ourselves and knowing ourselves. And then we have the secret self or the secret approach of, of the self, which is to get to know ourselves as that one, as true nature of being, which we saw so eloquently described in Plotinus. And so Pythagorean philosophy is built on those four pillars that can lead us to those three aspects of knowing ourselves. Let me just make sure that the Greeks, although they do have a non-dual philosophy, which nowadays we call the direct path, the non-dual path, they also, clearly lay out a gradual approach to philosophy. So we will get to know all three selves. Oh, we need to cultivate ourselves on all those different levels, mind, body, soul, until we're able to become the witnesses of what is here now, our own very true self, the daemon of one and all. So the first pillar of the Pythagorean philosophy, demarcating the methodology, is the development of intellectual critical abilities. Let's be clear, 
the fact that the vision or the union transcends those intellectual critical abilities doesn't mean that it annihilates the importance of developing it. Because without developing those intellectual critical abilities, we're not able to hear, uh, heal ourselves from all those presuppositions, bias, dogmas, old convictions, and, and fault reasoning old, or delusions with which we enter the path. First, we need to be healed from those before we can be able to to cleanse the soul, to open up into the mystery. So we need that clarity of right reasoning, critical thinking and understanding. And that is the epistemic aspect of the methodology of philosophy. Second, absolutely we need cultivation of heart and soul, compassion, loving kindness, benevolent, right motivation, love for all beings, moving beyond the concentric motivation and rising up into serving the common good for the benefit of all beings. That is called the ethical, the cathartic, or the political aspect of philosophy, because the ancients saw that to, to, to rise into that level of politics means to dedicate yourself into the serving the, the, the common good, what is good for the whole, not just for the part. The third pillar of philosophy is initiation. And here we go to the initiation aspect of philosophy, which involves the esoteric arts. Initiation into physical, psychic, and spiritual abilities and mystical use of them. We have a plethora of, of methods such as contemplation, ritual, meditation, sleep yoga in Pythagoras, right? We have all those different um, contemplative or collective rituals that are integral into knowing ourselves at a deeper level. And then fourth, it's the guidance of the perfected soul into enlightenment. What do we mean perfected soul? A soul that was able to clear away delusions, clear away the passions, and dive inside, cultivate the virtues, formulate an inner harmony, formulate love for all beings, and then that soul can be guided to the ultimate union where it can draw from the internal hearth of light, therapeutic waves of divine nourishment. Isn't that poetry from the ancient scriptures. And that is the enlightenment or awakening aspect. So the soul education involves what uh, Plato called education of the three parts of the human being, the rational, the faculty of knowing, the spirited, the heart, the power of emotion, and the appetitive, learning how to calm and uh, uh, concentrate and use wisely the powers of desire and senses. Finally, close with that and then open up uh, our discussion uh, uh, regarding that presentation, but also the relevance of that path nowadays. I'm just gonna um, mention that the philosophical education based on those pillars encompasses four, five main virtues, but virtues here don't mean what they mean in perhaps Christian or medieval uh, philosophy means habits of being, habits, the habits of being, the habits of self that is beneficial for me to develop in order to be able to rise into the fruition of eudaimonia. And those encompass political or ethical virtues or practical vir virtues. Mm -hmm. Those uh, correspond to what we call ethical philosophy which means to remove the negative habits of mind and body, to purify the, po the poisons or passions such as greed, jealousy, anger, and so forth, to detach from materialism, to start to cultivate a right ethical conduct and, and, and habits in the way we treat others, habits in, in the way we treat ourselves, and um, develop habits of, um, for example, self-constraint, um, mindfulness. We have a version of Hellenic mindfulness in Pythagoras. Mindfulness being to be able to hold ourselves and study our motivations and our energies before an action, during an action, and after an action, and know what's going on inside of our thoughts, our hearts, and our motivations or desires. Then there are the ritual or purifying virtues, cathartic virtues that uh, involve diet, mantras, energy work, and, and 
work with the subtle body. Oh, that's something that I didn't learn at the university. And mm -hmm. I did find, however, in the Chaldaic fragments that we need to take care of, of the purification of our luminous body, which the oracles also call the delicate vehicle of the soul. Psychis lepton ochima. We're talking about subtle body work, energy work. We have further mentions of that in Platonic mm -hmm. philosophy. And in theory, and, and after, only after that preparation, we can then rise into receiving teachings, theoretical virtues, about the nature of the world, mathematics, ideas, dialectics. Those are only helpful to us, teach the ancient philosophers, once we approach them with the right motivation. Because as Socrates says, any kind of science or knowledge, if it's detached from justice and virtues, it can become dangerous. And let me point out that we are very much witnessing the danger of, uh, of of knowledge falling into interest that can use it not but for the benefit of all. And isn't that part of the reason why we suffer right now this environmental damage in our planet? Because we are using technology and this beautiful knowledge, but not to the benefit of all. And finally, I'm just gonna mention that they were introduced the, um, the philosophical students into something called paradigmatic virtues. Here we go into the more esoteric aspect of philosophy because that involves pithing structures or um, what we call empowerments or transmissions of energies and ideas and understandings and, and kind of the opening of the width of consciousness that is mediated from teacher to student. And it doesn't happen exactly through words, but through energy or through symbolic objects or phrases. Here we go into the more esoteric aspects. And of course, finally, the theurgic, theurgic or theological virtues, um, our unifying virtues come through rituals or mysteries that facilitate the sudden revelation into the nature of being. And all that together is what we call the philosophical education of the Hellenes. So let me pause here after thanking you all for so patiently um, hearing me until now and ask, what is the relevance of all that today? 